thank you everybody for joining us today for our positive menopause webinar. Uh, Deborah and I are two women now in our post-menopause, I suppose, really. So we say that we've survived <laughs> the perimenopause and the menopause relatively unscathed. Uh, so <laughs> that's why we want to talk about positive menopause. So thank you, everybody. So just to say that we are both former biology teachers, but we're not medically trained. So we are not actually giving any medical advice. And obviously people should consult their GP if they need such advice. But we're just trying to give a general idea and having that biology background, we've maybe got a little bit more understanding than many people have in terms of how hormones work and how the body changes during the perimenopause and postmenopause and indeed menopause itself. So I will share my screen and bring up my PowerPoint. So that's us, Helen and Deborah, and this is our positive menopause presentation. So to start off by just saying a little bit about menstruation, first of all, because obviously enough, menopause is <laughs> menstruation stops. But I think it's important to think about what menstruation is and why it's there in the first place. So as I'm sure you know, it's the lining of the uterus being shed once a month as part of the menstrual cycle. And it's controlled by four main hormones, which are LH, FSH coming from the pituitary gland and also estrogen and progesterone, which come from the ovaries. And the point of it is to prepare the uterus so that it's in the right condition should fertilization take place. So that when an egg is fertilized, there will be a nice thick lining of the uterus of that fertilized egg or zygote as we would call it to implant into and develop into an embryo. That's the point of it. And we also need to remember today that trans men and boys and people who are assigned female at birth but are now non-binary have periods to go through menopause as well um, but we will we will be referring mainly to girls and women but we do need to remember that that's the case as well right so this is the menstrual cycle and menstruation at the bottom there showing the lining being released and coming out and bleeding so that we have to wear pads and tampons and those kinds of things but in actual fact menstruation is the end of the cycle we might count it as day one, but it's actually the end of the cycle. The cycle starts actually with the egg maturing. So that's the diagram to your left showing the egg maturing in the ovary. The egg matures, is released from the ovary. How many of you women actually can feel a pain sometimes in, your, in one side or the other? And so for some women, they can actually feel the egg being released. Travels down the oviduct to to the uterus. Um, so the egg is showing being released at the diagram at the top, generally happens on about 14 days, 10 to 14 days after you have had the first day of your period. It travels down the oviduct to the uterus and if it has been fertilized um, and become a viable zygote, it will implant into the uterus lining at about day 21. So if that uh, zygote does implant, that is the point that you are pregnant. Now you won't know until you've missed the period. Some women actually can feel the changes happening already to their bodies and will feel uh, and know they're pregnant before they miss a period. The first sign generally is that you have missed a period. If the zygote doesn't implant, hasn't, the egg hasn't been uh, fertilised, the zygote doesn't implant, nothing, nothing's going to happen, you lose everything. You lose the thick lining of the uterus wall, you use the egg, egg that hasn't been fertilised, you lose any dead sperm that might be there. It's a real clean out and you get rid of everything for, ready so that the uterus can be uh, prepared for the next egg. Now, there you can see the menstrual cycle uh, on the side. There are some of the things that come with it, uh, associated problems. So 
typically from the age of 11 to 14, women will start having periods, and but also they might well have the associated problems too. Uh, unpredictable periods, heavy blood loss, abdominal cramps, fatigue, PMS, and um, the final one, hopefully, most of you won't, will not experience, uh, and we will talk a bit more about th that, that in a few moments, but I recognize all those problems, had them all over a, over a 40 years of having, for, for, uh, 40 years of having periods. But I will say, if any of there, if there are any younger people with us today, that in actual fact, you, sometimes you don't get, get them all at the, all at the same time, because during your reproductive lifetime, your periods change and they can change quite significantly. And it's something that is useful to be aware of, to know whether you should do anything about it or not. Um, so that needs to be considered. So this next one, tackling problems of menstruation. Um, unpredicted heavy bleeding. We've all had those moments when we've gone, oh my goodness, I need to go somewhere now and sort myself out. Um, either you think I need to go somewhere now. Sometimes it may well be that you have heavy periods and you need to go often. So it's really, you really do need access to toilets and frequent access, access to, to, to those toilets. Um, how many of us have managed to forget to take the sanitary towels with us or whatever, and you could do with, uh, and, and, and have cobbled something together? Now I certainly have. So that you, and then when you need to get rid of them, it's not, sometimes it can, it, it, that can be a problem. Uh, and after you've dealt with all that, good hand washing faci facilities. Um, with your periods, you can get need pain relief and so to be able to take painkillers and sometimes to be able to get them and and sometimes again if you've forgotten them where do you get them quickly when you are how many of you get backache when you get menstrual when you're having your periods etc so being comfortable is is really important and i don't know about you guys even now though my periods have stopped i've actually said to my doctor I think I still cycle through a monthly cycle and there can be several days a month when, do you know what? I do not want to be very energetic. And you just need to, to actually have a, a bit of a, a, a slower day. And with all that comes that you need understanding from the people around you. Now, Helen and I are both biologists and we are both quite prepared to talk about these things but again I, it's quite interesting to find it's something that doesn't seem to get talked about even among women, women actually to sit down and have a discussion about these things hasn't happened very often in my life I hope the younger generation get better at doing that after you Helen Absolutely. Thank you for that, Deborah. And I agree, talking about problems to do with menstruation and also with menopause is half the battle. And if we can just encourage people, friends, family and colleagues in our workplaces to be prepared to discuss these things openly, then that will help us to solve our problems and to deal with the sort of issues that people have. And just to say one more thing about the previous slide, it's, it's talking about PMS as well. So, of course, PMS, premenstrual syndrome, is at the end of the menstrual cycle before the bleeding starts, sometimes for about a week before, uh, it happens because the level of progesterone in the body becomes higher than the level of estrogen, estrogen at that stage in the cycle. And that change in the balance of those two hormones results in all those <laughs> feelings that people may experience, such as bloating, tenderness, and so on. And of course, some people become extremely um, emotional, angry, upset, moody as well, as a result of the changing levels of those two hormones. So, period poverty now. So period poverty, as I'm sure you know, is an inability to buy sufficient sanitary hygiene products due to poverty. 
and it does occur in the UK, but also occurs very widely globally as well. And in the UK, there's been a move recently that schools would provide free sanitary products to students and I suppose more unofficially also to staff in need. I would imagine in most cases, staff wouldn't be going to ask for them every month, certainly when they're in a situation of forgetting to bring in or having insufficient uh, sanitary towels available, they might go to the school nurse and ask for one. And obviously that's, that's important, but extremely important for students that whilst they're in school, they're able to go and obtain sanitary protection when they need it. I'd imagine actually that because of lockdown and pupils being at home and not in school, that the problems of period poverty may have actually become worse. So Scotland's been ahead of the game right from the beginning, I have to say, and go Scotland. So they introduced a scheme early on to provide free sanitary products to all schools, colleges and universities. And that's absolutely as it should be because students in colleges and universities often have difficulty making ends meet and find it very hard sometimes to afford things like sanitary products. So to have them available there, I think is absolutely essential. And they've even gone a step further and they started to say, well, actually on public transport too, if people suddenly need these products whilst they're traveling, they also ought to be available. So they started a scheme to make free sanitary products available at their main uh, train stations in Edinburgh and Glasgow, and that may even continue further. Of course, it's been a bit of a difficult time with lockdown because there's been a lot less people traveling on trains, train timetables have been cut back. But I hope that that scheme is being continued and extended. And then the Steve Sinnott Foundation has a wonderful campaign, the Positive Periods campaign, which is all about encouraging girls and their mothers to learn the skills to make sustainable sanitary towels. And I'd just like to ask Anne Beatty, the CEO of the foundation, to say a few words about how the Positive Periods campaign is progressing. Anne. So um, yes, the um, Positive Periods programme has been running for about three years now, and it started in the Gambia with the Gambia Teachers Union. And the idea is that um, each project is slightly different. So the most important thing is that students and actually teachers in some of the countries we work in can't afford sanitary protection either so it's been really good for teachers um, so what we do is teachers train students and people in the community and we include men as well because men have come forward and said I'm a home economics teacher I need um, to know how to do this and the main um, thing about the investment is that all the pads are made with locally sourced materials. They're affordable, they're sustainable, reusable and washable. And they, they're long lasting. Uh, if they follow the washing um, and care instructions, they should last between two and three years. And so most importantly, they're eco-friendly as well. And the project started in the Gambia and then teachers from the Gambia went to Sierra Leone and taught other teachers there and that's now moved across to Malawi and Uganda and this year it will be happening in Cuba and Haiti as well and we've got quite a list of other um, countries asking for this project to take place and the most important thing is is that girls who were missing 50 days a year from school because of the things that you mentioned. So they didn't have um, pads, they weren't available. Um, they aren't able to dispose of them. There is the shame of it. They're not you know, encouraged to talk about these issues. And in many places, they definitely don't have hand washing facilities. So it's quite um, a, a difficult thing for some of the students we've been working with. So I'd encourage you to spread the word if you see us on, Twitter and LinkedIn, Facebook, all of the social medias, you know, please share 
and um, encourage people to get involved. And I have to say as well, when we were doing a campaign um, the Christmas before last, before we went into lockdown, there were lots, we were doing a fundraising campaign at a Christmas market and there was loads of women who came up from, and said, you know, we need this here. So we did a small pilot in Hertfordshire as well and that worked really well. Women were very, you know, encouraging and the feedback was good. So that's it from me. Thank you very much, Anne. And thank you everybody who's made a donation for the webinar today. And any donations made today will go to the Positive Periods campaign. So if anybody else would like to donate, that's where your money will go today to enable girls all around the world to make their own sustainable sanitary pads. So right. The next one, Stop or Miss Periods, Amenorrhea. Um, for those of us who have reached the age of menopause, the previous times for a lot of us when we have had our period stops is because we've been pregnant. Um, and I've done that six times. Uh, the periods have stopped and I uh, had six pregnancies. Um, but there are other, th th and that's the main known one probably, of, uh, along with me um, the menopause. But there are other times when you can find that the periods will stop. Um, excessive weight loss. And excessive weight loss, that could be because you're on a diet, but from through history and from other places around the world, it could be that you simply haven't had enough to eat, that, that you are starving. Um, and there was a lot of work done with women who came out of the concentration camps. They had uh, experienced ex excessive weight loss. Their periods had stopped. And they, did, they would have followed those women up to see what happened and, whether, and being able to have children later. We're all in it at the moment, stress for, for the stress of lockdown, the stress of our lives having been turned upside down. So those things are happening at the moment, but then ordinary life has a few stresses uh, for us as well. The um, loss of a job, uh, the finding that you are, that you are living with your in-laws, for example, or you, you find that you've got a member of the family dying. All those things mean stress, excessive stress, and your periods can stop. Excessive exercise, there are, for some women, they actually use exercise, not only to control their, to, often to control their weight. So the combined thing of weight loss and excessive exercise and their body weight being so low can mean the periods will stop. Um, uh, there's a condition called polycystic ovary syndrome and this is where you get lots of little cysts in in the ovaries and this can happen this can start when you first start your periods it can happen throughout your life you can have to deal with it throughout your life and it does mean that periods will be erratic um, it, you, it quite often went along with difficulties of getting uh, pregnant um, but these days they can actually do things about it so polycystic uh, ovary syndrome is not the the big problem that it that that the, for the women who had it that it used to be um, perimenopause menopause surgery medication they all kind of can come together in that um, often women as they coming into their late 40s 50s come into something called the perimenopause the peri uh, uh, and then into the menopause sometimes women will end up at that time having having problems that will mean they have surgery and they might have their ovaries and or their uterus removed which means they've effectively been put into a menopause and there are um, I'm not quite sure which they are, but there will be some drugs that also cause uh, periods to stop. The best one known is, of course, the pill. You actually have to stop taking the pill in order to have a, have a um, period, uh, in order to have your period. So 
those things are grouped together. And if we then go, can we go to the next slide? It's a sheet. So yes. it, oh. here is here is a comparison of the, your menopause and your perimenopause. I'm just going to check. Were you supposed to do this one, Helen? Were you yeah, going to go? So I was actually, so I'll, I'll carry on. I want to get in the flow. I'll, I'll keep <laughs> Thank you for getting this far. So people often confuse the terms or just bunch everything together and call it the menopause. So perimenopause, strictly speaking, is that time prior to the menopause when, although somebody is still menstruating and the ovaries are still producing estrogen, the periods may start to become irregular. There may also be breakthrough bleeding, so a little bit of bleeding in between periods. This often starts during the mid 40s, mid to late 40s, and its average length is about four years leading up to the menopause. Uh, ovarian function and estrogen production become erratic during this time, and indeed there is lower fertility. However, sometimes people can become pregnant during the perimenopause, so they shouldn't make assumptions that they won't. Of course, for some people who are desperately trying to become pregnant and start a family and have children, starting the perimenopause and then going on to enter the menopause are very heartbreaking times because it marks an end to their ability to naturally conceive a child. And I think it's always important for people to be sensitive about that especially um, in terms of the kind of conversations you might have with colleagues in the workplace. I mean, some, men, some women might be thinking, well, thank goodness for that. No more periods, no more chance of becoming pregnant. And they're absolutely delighted to get thus far. But for others, it can be a very sensitive issue. And the menopause. So the menopause is a time when the periods stop completely. The last menstrual cycle has happened, of course, you won't know that that's the last time, but when there's a point of 12 months that you have the last period, then you can say definitely that you are in the menopause. So levels of estrogen become significantly lower. Uh, they say for most women in the UK, the average age is 45 to 55. I think around 51 is um, probably the mean age of entering the menopause in the UK. Um, of course though, it can happen earlier. And certainly if women start to enter the menopause below the age of 40, they should have medical investigations done. They should be going to their doctor and finding out what's happening and seeing if they need any treatment. Also, once people are fully in the menopause, of course, they are infertile. And strictly speaking, after that, the next period of time is called the post-menopause, when all of these changes have been completed and then the rest of your life is in post-menopause. So, Deborah, back to you. Can I, can I just add one point? If you have not had a period for 12, year, uh, 12 months, not 12 years, 12 months, and you then have a period, it is important that you go and see your doctor and just get it checked out they will want you to go so just just be aware periods might have stopped stopped for 12 months if you have a have some more please go and get get it checked out now when you hit the perimenopause or the or the menopause um there you still got all the problems you 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 might have had with your periods anyway but then you got some extra ones you haven't had enough hassle so you now got hot flushes mood swings uh, you, you might feel like i'm uh, actually killing somebody a bit more often heart palpitations oh it's not just that cake you're you've been eating you actually can gradually put on weight um but there's also something that can also occur at this time and that is a lack of thyroxine and I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to get my, on my horse a little about this because lack of thyroxine, one in six women is known to have to have a thyroxine problem. 
so you're in your 40s, 50s, you have these problems and you think they might be the menopause and the perimenopause, etc. You also might have a contributing thyroxide problem. Thyroxide problems also give you hot flushes, um, heart palpitations, gain in weight, and they can affect your periods. So that heavy period you might you might be having, it might not be the menopause, it might be a thyroxine problem. So don't just assume you've got you've got the menopause. Please, it might be worth going and seeing your doctor and getting yourself checked out. Just as a little bit of homework, just ask some of your some of your friends in the 45, 55 age range and ask them if they've got a thyroxia problem and you will start having an idea of how big the big the issue actually might be. Um, the other problems that can come with the menopause, because you are not making those hormones anymore, is uh, low bone density. Um, you can lose uh, mass from your bones it's really important that you do keep exercising to keep that uh, bone mass up um you're sorry they all they say it everything heads south so a decrease in breast volume means you've got saggy boobs and the rest is heading south lower sex drive vaginal dryness and the one bit that's gone up is the hair the hair falls out that is also a sign of thyroxine. So all of this lot, even though I've gone through the menopause, this lot is because these days they have me on thyroxine and my hair is now lovely and thick. So just have a think at this point. For the younger women, think about these things are going to come, be aware of them. For older women, you might be thinking, oh, maybe I should go and get myself just checked out at the moment. So those are all the kinds of problems that you can have. So you might get all of them or none of them. If you get none of them, you are so lucky. If you get some of them, well, hey, periods weren't much fun either, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. You are gonna get rid of everything in a bit. Uh, and for those of you who get the lot, well, I'm really, I, you know, you really do have my, have my sympathies. And we've got next one. Yes. and. Absolutely, I'd agree with Deborah that not everybody gets all of them by any means, manner or form. So it's, uh, you just have to wait and see what happens to you really. But it's also important as Deborah says to get checked out if you feel your thyroxine levels may be too low or even too high, which could cause you to suddenly start losing weight. That's something else that happens a lot to women at that age. And to bear in mind that all the whole hormones in your body interact together. So it's often not quite a simple, straightforward situation where it's just about one hormone being too high or too low, but the way the various hormones interact. So with all those... Can I say yeah, go on. And I mean, it's really important that you look after your thyroxine. Thyroxine is intimately involved with your immune system. We need good immune systems. And if your thyroxine is low, that will affect your immune system. So please just get it checked. Good point. Okay, yeah, very good point, Deborah. So what to do? What to do about these issues? Well, one of the most important things is diet. Eat a healthy diet, which needs to include plenty of fresh fruit and veg and a good variety of. Also, alongside that, plenty of fibre, plenty of lean protein foods, which might be fish, lean meat, nuts, seeds, etc., Soy, soy products, more a little bit about that in a minute, because in um, soy products, <coughs> like phytoestrogens, those are chemicals that come from plants that mimic estrogens in your body. They can help you with that decrease in estrogen. So a really good, well-balanced diet is very important indeed. Exercise, also absolutely essential. Both Deborah and I are great advocates of exercise. Cardio, which could just be a brisk walk or could be a little bit more. Deborah does dancing, Highland dancing. I like to, to work out at the gym when I can. Um, cycling as well. And strength exercises, again, which can, can be done at the gym or can be done in other ways. But you really need to be working those muscles so that you maintain them and maintain bone density and muscle strength. And stretching exercises, partly for 
stress relief and partly to help against anything like back aches, uh, but also because your ligaments and tendons and so on will get stiffer with age. But if you keep on stretching them daily, you will be able to maintain a fair degree of flexibility. And Deborah and I both love the woman here. In fact, Deborah sent this to me. Always <laughs> one for keeping fit. Susie did her pelvic floor exercises regularly. Yeah, yeah right. absolutely. And really important at this time of life to stop smoking. Anybody who smokes or vapes would be really well advised to give it up at this time in life because it will definitely accelerate the aging process so it would be a really good time to to make the effort to stop then it's important to think about some kind of relaxation which might be mindfulness it might be meditation it might be through yoga or pilates or some kind of deep breathing exercises but it's very important to find a way of relaxing and limiting that stress. Because Can I just come in there as well? Yeah. We're yeah. often called the sandwich generation. You know, you've got children at one end, you've got your parents at the other, you've got uh, husbands, uh, boyfriends, partners, work, all of those things. And to look after yourself, relaxation, mind, mindfulness, meditation, you need to look after yourself because your body is changing and those changes mean that uh, you're not springing along like you were in your 20s. So just be kind to yourself. Helen, thank you. Yes, yes. Supplements and herbal treatments, well, there are different thoughts on these. Some people say if you eat a well-balanced diet, you don't need any supplements at all. Other people say, well, they find something that works for them. Some people talk about black cohosh, which I've never tried, but some people say that that can help to relieve some of the symptoms and associated problems. Um, some people like to use St. John's wort, which is used by quite a lot of people as a herbal treatment for depression and other conditions. So I think if anybody's got an interest in trying any of them, as long as you're taking them at a safe level, then it's fine just to try and see if any of them work for you. There's no guarantees they will, but they might. HRT, we're going to talk about a little bit more fully in a minute, but obviously that's hormone replacement therapy, which would be prescribed by your GP, which some women choose to have and some don't for various reasons, and as I say, we're going to go on to discuss that and then progesterone cream so that's just a cream you can literally buy it on the internet quite easily in a tube or little um spray or tub it's just about 20 to 25 pounds and people rub it on their skin now apparently some people believe that rubbing progesterone on your skin can help to delay the aging process. So for example, your skin won't become so dry. It will maintain more of its youthful sort of moisture and appearance. But other people say that putting progesterone on the surface of your skin makes no difference at all for the progesterone to have to be useful to you. It has to come inside of your body and get into your blood. So there's a couple of trains of thought on that. Again, if you can afford it and if you want to try it, there's no harm in trying to see if you feel it works for you, but definitely no um, consensus that progesterone creams really help. So now HRT, is it for me? I'm gonna let Deborah start off. So Deborah and I have taken different routes through this. So Deborah, I'm sure doesn't mind me saying that she has gone down the HRT route and I haven't. So Deborah's going to take you through this and talk about it and sort of give you a view from her side of things. And then I'll say a little bit afterwards about why I chose to make my decisions. Deborah. Well, I will talk a little bit about a friend first. And a friend said that if she hadn't had her HRT, she'd have killed somebody in her, in, in her menopause because she said it made such a difference to her mood swings, et cetera. And I knew her during those 10 years. And yes, um, she, she did need it. Uh, for me, I didn't go on it for the mood swings. I've, I have underlying health conditions and I have pain issues. And when I started going through the menopause, I suddenly realized 
I was in more pain. And if you consider what estrogen and progesterone do for you, um, every month you get you you do get the cramps and you get the backache that go with um, having periods. And when you are pregnant and when the baby comes, the the amount of pain that is associated with that, and yet women deal with it. And many women just ride it. So you think, well, there might well be, and why wouldn't there? Because Mother Nature can be kind to us at times. And, and associated with it, bonus, that it helps you deal with pain. Um, so I said this to my doctor, and he, he's, I've had him for 24 years, so he does know me quite, quite well. So we talked it through, and he, and he said, okay, we'll put you on HRT and see how it goes. So first of all, I got the pills. Well, I'm sorry, they were a disaster because the pills, so, some women can have them and the pills are fabulous. They're gonna, it's great. Uh, but if you, if you start taking the pills, one of the things you can have is end up with periods again and PMT again, and all the things that I was cheering because I was losing because I was having, having the menopause. So um, I went back to him and said, look, this isn't working. So we stopped that one. Um, and I said to him, well, can I have the patches? There are patches where you can have them, patches applied to your skin and the hormones are in there. It gives you a constant low level of the hormones and it helps, it helps, I think it helps with my pain levels. Uh, so, and I am taking other drugs to deal with that. So breakthrough pain levels, some, some certainly to consider. The other thing to consider, again, on the positive side is osteoporosis. When you stop having those, the female hormones going through your body, you are at risk of having a lower bone density. And that, especially for women who have um, the menopause below 50. If you are below 50 and you start the, the menopause, you you may well have osteoporosis problems and as it says uh, as it says there somewhere or it did I, I i've got it all up that the hrt um sorry this that one so please think about osteoporosis in the summer last summer i fell over my dog on the beach on wet sand i was running at the time I put an arm out and I landed on my outstretched arm at speed. Now, if I had osteoporosis, I was looking at wrist, wrist, forearm, top of my arm, shoulder, uh, shoulder uh, here. All of those could have gone. My son was amazed I didn't break something, to be perfectly honest. I did do the tendons in my elbow. It took eight to ten weeks to sort out to get the full use back in my arm but I didn't break anything and I thought go HRT so I feel positive about HRT I am on low, a very low constant dose there are problems with it so you have to think about and they did talk to me about this increased risk of breast cancer um, when you've used it for it, it, when you've been on it for five years the doctor has said to me well 10 years and then we'll review it and I'm thinking yeah more pain mm, osteoporosis I might try and talk him into a bit longer so for me it's been a positive mostly been a positive experience once I got sorted out with something that actually worked for me um, uh, and, for, and the other thing you can think about, reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. And that might well be, you know, men don't have so many female hormones. They get more cardiovascular disease than women do. But when, when you have the menopause, suddenly your risk starts going up because you do not have the protection from those female hormones. So your HRT can give you back that protection um as well as well just a little thought there obesity and al uh, alcohol can in increase the risk of breast cancer so really you need to have a, a, a swift discussion in your head do i take hrt with the benefits that it gives me however 
I could be at risk of breast cancer? Or do I think about doing something about my weight and my alcohol consumption? Because if I'm overweight and consume too much alcohol, that increases my risk anyway. So do something about the weight, check your thyroxine level, reduce the alcohol, and maybe take the HRT. But all of those things are your personal decisions to make. One of the things that I would be interested if anybody wants to volunteer, I had my last child at 40. And when I became pregnant, I went off red wine. I have never gone back on red wine. And now I'm in, and I, I just can't drink it. And I do try every so often because my husband likes it and I try it and I think, no, still can't drink the red wine. In addition, as I've hit the menopause, I don't, I don't actually want alcohol. You know, I don't, I don't want it or need it in the same way. And I think, oh dear, never mind. Maybe a nice uh, glass of elderberry uh, presse instead will just uh, touch it. But that alcohol and being able to drink alcohol, I think has gone with the menopause. So quite, quite a lot of things to think of. And I don't think the HRT brings back the wish for alcohol either. So there's no taking HRT that hasn't done that either. So just sit down, have a think. Is HRT for me? Go and see your doctor, talk through the risks and they will tell you the risks, but also think about some of the, the, the positive things that also go with it. Every woman has to decide HRT, is it for me, for herself? Don't let somebody else talk you into yes or no. It has to work for you. Thank okay. you, Deborah. So I chose the route of not uh, using HRT. I didn't have any particularly significant problems through the perimenopause and into the menopause. So nothing actually ever triggered me to go to my GP and asked for it or find out more about it but also I discovered almost as a matter of chance because I happen to have an IUS an intrauterine system which is very similar to an IUD but releases progesterone into the blood very slowly and constantly throughout its five-year life or I think it's maybe even has a 10-year life now that the progesterone that was being released by the IUS was actually helpful through the perimenopause and menopause. And the doctor one day just told me that as a matter of, you know, by the way, because I think I said something like, oh, should I think about having this IUS removed soon? And uh, she said, oh, no, you should keep it in longer because if you have it in, if you go through the perimenopause and into the menopause, it will actually help you by releasing that progesterone because although it does release it into the uterus, some of it gets into your blood and more widely is circulated around your body. So I think that's actually very little known, but that was actually helpful to me at that time. So that was sufficient really. I haven't felt that I've needed anything more. I do think about things like osteoporosis and CVDs. In terms of osteoporosis, I am aware, and at some point I will go and get a bone density scan. I have to not have my one yet. But I do exercise a lot, and that does need to be weight-bearing exercise to um, continue to stimulate your bones to remain strong. Also with CVD, which runs in my family, uh, I do consider that. And again, I consider that I'm keeping my risk fairly low by exercising a lot, eating a healthy diet, and maintaining a sensible weight so both of those are on my radar um but at the moment i haven't found a need for hrt so overall what we'd like to say is welcome and embrace your menopause because it's a natural stage of your life cycle hooray that you've got no more concerns about periods and pregnancies and it's absolutely a time of your life to show yourself more self-love, to pursue your passions and to do the things you really want to do. Can I just come in there as well? Before, as well, There's one more thing that you might like to consider. 
is why did we evolve to have a menopause? I have two Cocker Spaniel dogs, one of whom is 13, which is equivalent of about 77, and I'm waiting for her to have her next season. Most mammals do not stop their periods so, uh, or their seasons or whatever it is. So why did humans evolve to, to, for their periods to stop at this point in their life? And there was, a, there was a very interesting documentary on television, which actually went through it. And what they concluded, what, what one of the conclusions was, is that having an older wom woman in the tribe or in the group, where, wherever, who wasn't likely to get pregnant, who had a lifetime of experience and knew all the local knowledge of where food was, meant that more of the younger women's children in the in the group would survive so that young women having babies they are limited to how much they can move around they need to be fed by their family by, by the people around them so having women who were older who had been there who, who had done that women in tribal society are the ones that bring in the food that stops the tribe starving they know where the berries grains roots all of those are the men go and hunt and bring in the high value protein which means the tribe will be successful but it's the women who bring in the food that is the basis of the diet and keeping everybody alive so having one or two or three or four the more the better actually if you're going to have a good strong uh, community is that these women do not menstruate they do not have children but they are there to help and provide support for the younger women who are producing the next generation and the whole community. And I think we need to remember that, that that's why it happens. We also need to look at our current society and think about how that relates to our current society. How many women do you know in their 40s and 50s and whatnot that are doing those extra caring roles, either within their family where they're looking after children, the grandchildren, etc., and or within the community more broadly where they're running support groups and all of those things. So menopause happened for a reason, we evolved to have it, but then culturally women were important at that point for the help and support they give. They give. And I think if you look in our society now, those women are still there. And I think that they, they, they should be celebrated. Menopause is a point that you've got a bit of wisdom behind you and a bit of knowledge and a bit of oomph. Now you don't have to worry about having babies and those kinds of things. You can look around and you can choose what you do next. To be involved with your family and community and supporting them all or go and do that degree you wanted to to do or cycle across France hope we would be allowed to do something like that again but just think about what how positive what positive things can I do in my menopause and over the next 5 10 15 these days it could be as much as 25 or 30 years what do I want to do with it and be positive about making a positive contribution to my world how's about that Brilliant, Deborah. And you know what? I'm in there trying to do it. <laughs> Sums it up perfectly. So we thank you for listening and joining us today. And we now really value your questions or thoughts or reflections. 